Madam President and Senators, good morning. Today I want to focus on the second line from the National Anthem. March on to glory, your bright banners waving high. This second line in the National Anthem stresses to us as a country the importance of having high goals and objectives that will propel us to the next level. The purpose of a banner symbolizes unity and also the, the I'm sorry, this purpose of a banner symbolizes unity. And the banner also prepares the ba uh, serves as a flag that symbolizes security, hope, and freedom. In ancient times, banners served as a rallying point for battles. As we journey to the 50th anniversary of our independence, we as a people must see, ask ourselves what high are the ideals and goals are we lifting up as leaders and behemoths to promote unity and national development? What banners are you as senators waving that will propel our country to the next level? Psalm 20 and 5 says, May we shout for joy over your salvation and the name of our God set up our banners. Banners serve the purpose to unite the people to give hope and security, and to be a rallying call in times of trials and battles. As senators, I ask you, what banners are you waving? We live in a times of difficulties and blessings. We are facing challenges to our nation's identity with increased crime, family breakdown, and many other vicissitudes. But there are also many things that are going so well for us. But we need to remind our nation and people that we are a special people and nation, birthed by a quiet revolution and favored by God. Psalm 16, a part of verse 4 states, You have set up a banner for those who fear you. We must remember that we are um, blessed by the men who have gone before, who have dreamed and visioned for our nation. They held high ideals, goals, and made great sacrifices. And their hard work has caused us to be wonderful recipients of these present blessings. We cannot just see ourselves as entitled persons, but must seek to build on the rich legacy of our forebears to motivate the next generation. Psalm 22 and 28 says, Remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers, and I add mothers, have set. On the road to our 50th I want to encourage you, Senators, to reflect on the period leading up to independence and to seek to, redis to rediscover the dreams, goals, aspirations, and visions of those who were preparing us to become a new nation. Allow them to guide you and lead you as you look towards the future. Remember that we are one people, and together each of us, must do our very best, and each of you in this chamber and beyond, to lift up high ideals that will encourage, inspire, and unite our people. I want to also encourage you to remember as leaders and nation builders that there will be times of challenge, but we are a goodly, strong, resilient people, and together we can overcome. Proverbs 16 and 3 says, Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. John Jim Rim said, all good men and women must take responsibility to create legacies that will take the next generation to a level we can only imagine. And so, Senators, march on to glory, your bright banners waving high. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pause in this special season of Lent to thank you for your care and guidance to our nation. Help each legislator and Bahamian to seek to build rich legacies that will bless this present generation and inspire future ones. Help our senators to learn and build on the past and to give faithful service to their God and nation. Bless the deliberations of this day and make our senators and nations be on one accord. We pray all these blessings in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Please join in the prayer of our Lord, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, Senators. Indeed, it is a pleasure to see all of you again. Adoption of minutes. Uh, Madam President, uh, good uh, morning and uh, welcome back. Madam President, I move that the minutes of the Senate of the session of se session of the Senate held on Thursday, 9th of March, 2023, be adopted. Is there a seconder? It has been moved and seconded that the minutes of the meeting held on Thursday, the 9th of March, 2023, be adopted. As many are in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. The minutes of the 9th of March, 2023, are adopted. Motions for leave of absence, leave to resign. Swearing in of new senators. Communications by the president. Good morning once again, senators and colleagues. I wish to thank Reverend Carla Culmer for her continuous godly devotion and prayer over these proceedings. As always, Madam Chaplain, your devotion was timely and inspirational. We look forward to your spiritual guidance, and I thank you immensely. The Senate President accepted an invitation from the Secretary General, Martin Chango, of the Interparliamentary Union to attend IPU's 146th General Assembly held in Manama, the Kingdom of Bahrain, in March 2023, where over 2,500 delegates attended from 150 countries around the world. The delegation from the Bahamas included Minister of State for the Public Service, Minister Pia glover Roll. Senators Barry Griffin, the Vice President, and Senator Dr. Eresia Hepburn Forbes. The general debate of the 146th Assembly focused on promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies fighting intolerance. The 146th Assembly launched a new campaign called Parliament for the Planet which is designed to mobilize parliaments and parliamentarians to act on climate emergency. In 1989, the Interparliamentary Union was formed as an international organization of parliaments of sovereign states and provides a unique platform for parliaments from around the world to interact and develop cooperation on major global issues of our time. The IPU comprises 179 member parliaments and its work is, pre is predicated on the idea that strong and effective parliaments can safeguard fundamental human rights, ensure sustainable development that leaves no one behind, achieve gender equality, empower youth, create pathways for peace and security 
and protect the planet. At the recent General Assembly, it was noted that the adoption of greener policies and embracing a culture of sustainability, parliaments and parliamentarians can help address the climate crisis and pave the way for stronger climate action. The IPU recognizes that parliaments are called upon to consistently evolve to better serve their constituents. In addition to attending the various sessions, the Bahamas delegation met the president of the IPU and engaged in high-level discussions with the IPU Secretary General regarding the Bahamas possibly joining the IPU. The Senate President supports the Bahamas Parliament joining IPU and hopes that we can become members in the not too distant future. The Senate President extends sincere gratitude to His Majesty King Hamid, the King of Bahrain, who graciously hosted a regal dinner for presiding officers at his palace in the Kingdom of Bahrain. His Majesty the King Hamad was an exceptional and most gracious host who was extremely knowledgeable about the Bahamas and one day hopes that he and his entourage can visit our shores. Well, we gotta encourage, give some enthusiasm. <laughs> On behalf of the Bahamas delegation, I extend heartful appreciation and gratitude to the Secretary General Martin Changong and the President of the IPU, Diate Pacheco, and the entire administrative and secretariat team of the IPU for their warm welcome and hospitality during our stay. On a sad note, the Chair extends sincere condolences to the families of Eldred Ed Bethel, a noted, a noted journalist and stellar diplomat, Shazara Carey, an educator of 38 years, and Sheena Burrows, an administrative accountant, and a dynamic, caring, and positive young lady from Fox Hill community. It is my prayer that, the, that God will strengthen their families as they progress during this difficult and traumatic time. On a happy note, the Senate President is pleased to welcome distinguished students from the International School of Business, Entrepreneurship, and Technology. The International School of Business and Entrepreneurship and Technology is the first magnet business school in the Bahamas and offers a non-traditional approach to education. The school is recognized as a green school because the campus is 50% solarized and digitalized. The International School of Business is a non-profit business school that constantly innovates to meet the needs of students in a world that's ever-changing faster than ever before. More than just a business school, the school is a dynamic and multicultural community that educates, inspires, and connects some of the most forward-thinking business partners from around the world. The school is a place where anything and everything is possible. It's where boundaries of knowledge are pushed beyond the imaginable where diverse ideas and perspectives aren't just accepted, they are encouraged and embraced. And I say, well done. So I'd like to thank the students and administrators for coming to the gallery today. I would like for you to please stand as I call your names. Mitzi Turnquest, Senior Director. Alexander Galanis, President of the Student Council. <laughs> Philip Ferguson, the head boy. 
Coy Adderley, head girl. Isabella Aguib Roll, deputy head girl. Laron Lockhart, deputy head boy. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the daughter of our parliamentary colleague, Kaylee Roll, the daughter of Minister Pia Glover Roll. I thank you all for joining us in the gallery today, and I hope that you have a most educational and rewarding experience. Thank you. Also in attendance is Mrs. Megan Cox. Can you please stand? Ms. Cox is a forward-thinking law student who is also an active member of the Pilot Club, Caribbean Women in Leadership, and the Mount Tabor Church. We thank you for being here today. Finally, last, and by no means least, the Chair acknowledges the presence of my extra special guest, Ms. Dolores Munnings. Can you please stand? Mrs. Munnings is a successful retired banker and client accountant of 48 years. She's married to Reverend Dr. Stanford Munnings of Exuma, and they share 51 years of marital bliss. So you married folks know where to go for free counseling. She's also the proud mother of three. Can remain standing, please, Ms. Munnings. We're not finished with you yet. We've got to get, get, make sure you get all your roses. She's the proud mother of three, the grandmother of four, and the great-grandmother of one. Ironically, two of her grandchildren are in the Senate today. Deontay Seymour, a student of the International Business School, and Dania Gray, very encouraging to see that we have the different generations represented in the Senate. I've never presided this has happened, so I thank you all for coming today, all as a family. Um, Ms. Munnings is a respected member of the Canterbury Park community, and I know that they are watching, and she is well known as a kind-hearted and caring neighbor who offers wise counsel to the youth and anyone who would listen. Let's make our senior gem feel very welcome in the Senate today. And I thank, I thank you for coming, Ms. Munnings. And generally speaking, the Chair thanks everyone for visiting the upper chamber to observe the debate in the Senate. I trust that you will leave more informed and enlightened and that the Senators will behave. May God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I hereby table the President's communication. I thank you all. Messages, I'm sorry. <laughs> messages from the Governor General, messages from the House of Assembly, Bahamas number 25, message to the Honorable the President and the Honorable Members of the Senate from the Speaker and Representatives of the Honorable House of Assembly. The House of Assembly acquaints the Honorable the Senate that they have passed the following bills and desire the conscience of that Honorable Chamber, namely, a bill for an act to repeal and replace the Public Procurement Act, to revise the framework and procedures for the public procurement of goods, works, and services, to further promote fair and equitable treatment of all suppliers consultants, and contractors to further promote competition, transparency, sustainability, and integrity in public procurement and for connected matters. A bill for an act to provide for the control and management of public finance, for the operation of the consolidated fund, 
for the authorization of expenditures for the administration of special funds for the investment of public money for internal audits for the management of government property for the preparation of financial statements and, and reports on public finances for the accountability of public entities and government business enterprises collection of revenue and for transitional matters and consequential amendments and to provide for matters connected therewith and incidental thereto. House of Assembly, Nassau, 15th March, 2023, Patricia Devoe, Speaker. Bahamas number 26, message to the Honorable, the President, and Honorable Members of the Senate from the Speaker and Representatives of the Honorable House of Assembly. The House of Assembly acquaints the Honorable, the Senate, that they have passed the following bills and desire the content of that honorable chamber, namely, a bill for an act to provide for international commercial arbitration, a bill for an act to amend the Arbitration Act 2009, House of Assembly, Nassau, 22nd March, 2023, Patricia Devoe, Speaker. Laying of documents by ministers. Madam President, I beg leave to lay on the table of the Senate a copy of the Ministry of Health and Wellness Bahamas Steps 2019 Report, Non-Communicable Diseases and Risk Factors in the Bahamian Economy. Order the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Sorry, that should say Bahamian Society. Further laying of documents? And none, Madam President. Communication by ministers? Communication by senators? Questions? Answers to questions? Presentation of petitions? Appointment of select committees? Reports of committees? First reading of bills? Second reading and committal of bills? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, good morning. And might I begin Chair. by, sorry? Chair, I recognize the Senator, the Honorable Michael Thank Alphides. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for allowing me to recognize you, Senator Thank Alphides. you. Thank you so much, Madam President. Madam President, I want to begin by welcoming you back uh, to the, from your conference and as well welcoming you back to the chamber. In your absence, Senator Pickstock did an admirable job in uh, filling in, but I think uh, senators would agree that uh, nobody does it quite like you, Madam President. So welcome back. Thank I, you, thank you, Senator Halkidis. I want to, I want to um, also join you in welcoming the students and administrators from the International School of business, entrepreneurship, and technology, and, uh, and the administrators as well, and congratulate the administrators and the directors on their foresight in conceptualizing, and not only conceptualizing, but bringing into effect this um, magnet school of business, uh, which is, I understand, um, very successful in high demand, and uh, so we congratulate them. On that note, Madam President, I had the opportunity to 
chair with the Small Business Development Corporation last evening in their awards for businesses um, that are energy efficient, the most energy efficient uh, businesses. And they conducted a program beginning in January where they received applications for businesses who wanted to showcase their steps towards green energy and energy efficiency. And last evening there were 10 finalists and um, three of the, the top three actually received grants to further their use of energy efficient technologies in their business, Madam President. And so I, I thought I should, I should uh, recognize the, um, the 10 finalists uh, that were from around the Bahamas. Uh, the 10th was New Life, the restaurant business on E Street. And then the 9th was New Duff. Uh, the 8th was MGS Grocery Store from Long Island. And the seventh was Perfect Tone, which is a Bahamian manufactured skincare product. Uh, the sixth was Best Energy Bahamas, which um, helps uh, households and businesses um, track their energy and uh, track their energy usage, and as well conserve energy. A and M Electrical, uh, which is involved in the construction industry, and as well as from Long Island. Um, Sawyer's Studio was number four. We all know, or we all recall, Sawyer so Studio. <laughs> H. Russell Convenience Store was the third, and that's, that's a business located in North Andros. Uh, the Promise Institute, which is a school, was second. And then the winner for the overall energy efficient business was J&M Island Shops Consultants. So, Madam President, I thought it was a very, very, um, a, you know, creative and, and, and really forward-looking program whereby we know that in this country um, as, as well as around the world fuel, fuel prices and hence, hence electricity prices are constantly rising and so this was a program where businesses were able to showcase their activities for example installation of LED lights the use of solar so that they can bring their expenses down and I think it's instructive for Households as well, Madam President. And so, you know, in the midst of the of the high energy prices, and of course we have to do as a government all that we can to help to moderate that. Um, it's good to see that uh, you have individuals who are actively uh, taking steps to reduce their expenses, Madam President. I want to join you as well, Madam President, in expressing condolences to the family of the late uh, Ed Bethel, veteran broadcaster and diplomat. Um, who passed away recently and is uh, being funeralized tomorrow. Uh, we express condolences to his uh, family and express thank to, thanks to them for all of the service that he has done, that he has um, offered and delivered for so many years in so many different uh, capacities as broadcaster, as diplomat, and as mentor to, to so many. And so we pray for the repose of his soul and president and um, the yes and so madam president today as I rise I rise to move for second reading and committal we will be dealing with two bills today the public procurement bill um, 2022 and the public finance management bill 2023 Madam President, I would like to indicate at this time that in that in the other place, there was an amendment made to the public procurement bill, to section three of the bill, section three, uh, subsection two, where it speaks to what the what procurement practices the act shall apply to, and in the original bill there was a duplication as the um, as the the processes by which the, uh, to which the act applies were, were enumerated. Um, there was a, a duplication between E and F, E and H. And so in the House, H was uh, deleted, and then the lettering was uh, changed to 
to fall into place. And so this, I would just like to, at this point, Madam President, move to withdraw the bill that was originally laid in the Senate that contains the error and replace it with this new bill and that was corrected uh, for that error in the House of Assembly. So moved. And uh, I'm, I'm with, uh, with the concurrence of yes. the, of the um, other side. side of Senator. Is there a seconder? Can you stand for the record, please? Senator we concur. recognize Senator the Honorable Darren Enfield. It's good to have you back, Madam President. Uh, we concur. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Senator Enfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Enfield, and thank you, Madam President. And so, Madam President, um, we will be um, dealing today with um, the public procurement bill, which deals with um, matters related to the, procure the procurement by the government, meaning central government and its agencies of goods and services, and the public finance management bill. And as a sort of an introduction, Madam President, what we're doing here today is part and parcel of the duty, the obligation really, of Parliament, Parliament meaning the House of Assembly and the Senate, to report to the Bahamian people on the use of their funds. We see this played out, Madam President, in the budget process. The public part of the, public of the budget process is the presentation of the budget, the debate of the budget, and we have a very, very uh, public and detailed component of that budget exercise when we get to the committee stage and each head, each line indeed of spending, Madam President, is analyzed and um, the side opposite as well as you know, perhaps those on the, on the back bench as it exists um, are able to put questions to the government and the government uh, must answer those questions related to the expenditure of public funds. And that is a part of the exercise to account uh, to the public because from its very origins, Madam President, the purpose of Parliament is to account to the public, particularly in matters of taxation and expenditure. And that is why in our uh, tradition, money bills, uh, bills related to uh, public money always take preeminence over any other bill and in fact uh, must originate in that other place where the members are elected. The budget process that is not seen, Madam President, is the process by which ministries are asked to submit their requests, back and forth between the Ministry of Finance and those ministries. And some would say not too much of a force, but more of a back from <laughs> the Ministry of, of, of Finance. Is this exa is then examined by cabinet, which concludes on it, it is brought to the the House of Assembly where it's debated by the elected members in the full light of uh, public glare so the public can see Madam President and, and the reporting the various reporting the mid-year budget now uh, recent vintage the fiscal strategy report the monthly reports on financial performance done by the central bank and more recently required by the Minister of Finance the quarterly report on the, on the performance of the economy, on the um, government uh, uh, statistics. Again, part of our obligation to report to the Bahamian people on the use of their funds. The role is also a role for the Public Accounts Committee of the Parliament, where the opposition has the majority and the Auditor General has a role in examining the accounts of the government to ensure funds are spent in the manner that they were uh, voted on and that they were approved for, within the limits that they were approved for, and that the government has gotten value for money for the money that it, that it has expended. So it's very, very important uh, what we do here today, Madam President, as we debate the Public Finance Management Bill, the long title of which is, which really um, speaks to uh, what the bill entails, a bill for an act to provide for the control and management of public finance 
for the operation of the Consolidated Fund for the authorization of expenditures for the administration of special funds for the investment of public money for internal audit for the management of government property for the preparation of the financial statements and reports on public finances for the accountability of public entities and government business enterprises that's your 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 public corporations and other agencies of the government collection of revenue and for transitional matters and consequential amendments meaning um, amendments of other amendments of other are required because of, of the relation to other pieces of legislation and for connected matters and so the public financial matters uh, public financial management bill deals with all of those issues of from the collection to the expenditure to the audit and reporting of um, financial matters so let's put it put colloquially where the money's going <laughs> how you know how we collect it and where does it go the public procurement bill madam president if we go to the long title deals that they build for an act to repeal and replace public procurement act to revise the framework for public procurement of goods and services and to further, prom further promote further uh, promote fair and equitable treatment of all suppliers, consultants, and contractors, and to further promote competition, transparency, sustainability, and integrity in public procurement and for connected matters. In short, how the government uh, spends its money, but we're seeking in this legislation as well to not adopt a strictly business approach but to allow for the promotion of equitable treatment of suppliers and to promote transparency competition sustainability and as we should see as I uh, speak uh, uh, to the bill um, to give some of those who might have traditionally been left out or not been able to compete to give them a chance and so, Madam President, the Public Finance Management Act 2021 and the Public Procurement Act 2021 were part of a compendium of legislation passed by the former administra administration in the spring of 2021 and brought into, in spring of 2020, brought into effect in 2021. Uh, we believe, Madam President, that it is necessary to pass this replacement legislation that we are debating today um, for the orderly development of this society. My first focus will be on the Public Procurement Bill 2023, which will repeal and replace the 2021 Public Procurement Act. We believe, Madam President, that the 2021 Public Procurement Act unfortunately does not take into account the structural imbalance in our economy, and this is an imbalance that we are obliged to correct. The Public Procurement Bill 2023 creates provisions for preferential treatment for small and worker-owned businesses. It allows the Minister responsible for procurement, the Minister of Finance, to appoint the Procurement Board. Um, the previous Act required the Board be appointed by the Prime Minister. This administration, Madam President, took the necessary steps to develop and implement a procurement improvement plan. We have also developed a career path for procurement officers ensuring that they are treated fairly and as fairly as their technical colleagues in the Ministry of Finance. We have acquired and brought on stream the Go Bonfire platform, a best-in-class procurement platform that is being implemented in the public sector and at the Public Hospitals Authority. Since the launch of the program, I'm advised in November of 2022, we have recorded 1,490 vendor registrations, 299 posted opportunities, and they have identified $2.6 million in estimated savings from the use of the platform. And um, we expect these numbers to grow, Madam President, as more agencies uh, utilize the program. The Public Procurement Act 2023 uh, Madam President, I will go through some of the uh, main uh, changes. In Clause 2, a number of new definitions have been added to the interpretive provisions of the Act. 
in particular when it referring to development preference, um, meaning uh, preferences um, in the award of contracts um, that might be applied. Uh, the development preferences will apply to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, uh, women-owned businesses, family island-owned businesses, and youth-owned businesses. So that gives the definition in, for in Section 43 of the bill. It speaks to development uh, preferences in Clause 2. It says which businesses will have the advantage of those uh, development preferences. Uh, clause 3 of the bill seeks to exclude additional areas which are not due to their nature procured. Um, the additional excluded areas are financial consultancy in relation to public debt, audit services, contracts entered by the government in support of or pursuant to an international treaty, accord or convention, an international multilateral agreement, an agreement between the government and an international funding agency whose procurement rules are mandatorily applied to any procurement contracts partially or wholly funded by monies loaned or advanced to such an agreement. So if you are uh, advanced monies by an international agency um, who has their own procurement rules or who are not normally subject to procurement rules, um, you do not have to apply these, uh, this act or this act uh, exempts. Clause 4 of the bill seeks to ensure that persons desirous of participating in procurement are registered by the Public Procurement Department in the electronic procurement system. Um, this clause in the former act did not apply in relation to procurement of goods, works, and services by the international bidding method of payment. Madam President, it's important, some people might say, why do you have to, um, you know, go online, why do you have to register with the with the, um, with the portal. It's important, Madam President, so that uh, businesses are aware of opportunities that become available. It gives, as well, the opportunity for reports uh, to be made, or reports to be run as to um, who, who bid, who was successful, who was unsuccessful, and it gives the opportunity to go back to those businesses and say, well, you know, you've been on, on this portal, you haven't bid, is there an issue? or um, you haven't been successful, maybe these are some of the things you need to work on. And so I know every time we talk about doing things online, there is a, an, an aversion sometimes and a resistance because, you know, normally people, well, not normally, but, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm not computer savvy or I'm not computer literate. But I'm, I'm, I think that is going, you know, that is lessening on a present because it, it has to change and, and you know, by doing it ele electronically, it gives us a better opportunity to generate reports and audit and increase transparency. Um, so clause 5 of the bill empowers the minister by order to apply all or part of this act to public bodies. Uh, formerly, the chief uh, procurement officer was empowered with this authority. So the minister now can apply this order to um, all, all public bodies, all of all are part of this act to various uh, public bodies. Clause 8 of the bill added subsection 3 that provides for a procuring entity to enter into a framework agreement. This will allow a procuring entity to enter into an agreement comprising a long-term relationship with a provider or range of providers to place orders without going to tender each time. So this is something that you continually purchase or you, you know, regularly purchase or you routine. It's part of a routine. You don't have to continue, uh, continually uh, go to tender. Uh, under the existing act, the Public Procurement Board consists of nine members. Uh, by virtue of Clause 11 in this bill, the board will now be reduced to seven members uh, to ensure uh, better efficiency. And um, in the new act, the chairperson, the secretary, and two persons from civil society are appointed by the Minister of Finance. I wanted to say here um, to Madam President that uh, when we, if I would go back to Clause 8, which speaks about um, going back to tender each time. You know, as part of the cost control efforts, um, the government of the Bahamas is seeking to move more towards uh, central uh, purchasing. And sometimes we have a bit of resistance uh, to that because, you know, centralized control um, 
I, I would like to say that it is not the intention of the government to have that apply to family islands. And this clause here where it talks about not having to go back every time uh, when you're, you know, you're routinely purchasing something, not having to go to Kenya every time gives an opportunity for, for um, greater efficiency and you, know, you don't run into the situation where you're running out of, 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 out of supplies. Um, Madam President, under, under Clause 16 of this Act, each procuring, it, and uh, Clause 20 of the former Act, each procuring entity is required to establish a tender committee to review bids and award contracts with an estimated value of more than $50,000. We are reducing that amount to $25,000, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam President. Um, so that uh, now that committee can award contracts up to $25,000. All of the financial thresholds in the existing act have been revised to provide greater flexibility and transparency and to ensure that the procuring entities can operate and enter into agreements efficiently and swiftly. And so we've amended the thresholds as follows. If a procurement contract is more than is um, more than $25,000 but does not exceed $400,000. So 25, under $25,000, the board can do it. Between $25,000 to $400,000, the tender committee shall evaluate and they will provide their recommendation and the minister um, can approve, um, the minister who's responsible for that entity can approve up to $400,000 upon recommendation of the tender committee. So not just the minister saying there's a contract for $350,000 that still has to come through the tender committee, but the minister uh, can approve it. Uh, for more than $400,000, so between $400,000 and, um, and $2.5 million, um, the tender committee shall forward it to the procurement board, and the procurement board um, um, shall make, uh, act on the recommendation, either approve it or send it back. In the case of more than $2.5 million, the tender committee shall forward to the board for recommendation. That's the procurement board, and thereafter the board must send that recommendation to cabinet for approval. And so, 25,000 can be done by the procurement entity. In 25, 400, the procurement entity was recommended to their minister, who can approve or not approve between 400,000 and 2.5. The send a committee of the entity, send it to the procurement board who can approve it, and beyond $2.5 million, it has to go to cabinet. And that is useful when we, we talk about increasing the limits, Madam President, because, you know, in many instances, our legislation contains figures that have not changed since the law was written. So you look at some things and, and, you, and you see these numbers, and, um, you know, the prices have gone up, the value of contracts has gone up particularly when you talk about things like um, ICT and other services. So um, we believe it is prudent to increase the, the limits but maintain the, the um, level of, o of oversight, checks and balances. Um, and there are some other notable changes, um, um, Madam President, that um, you know contracts below a certain threshold are limited to national bidders unless approval is sought to open that procurement to international bidders. So on a certain level, it has to be national and there's nothing wrong with that. No apologies uh, for that. I remember, remember back when the straw market going down <laughs> and there was a proposal to seek financing to, to rebuild the straw market. And one thing that held it up was the government at the time was seeking to borrow money from the Caribbean Development Bank. And the holdup was, well, Part of their rules are you have to open it up to open the bidding up to other, you know, all countries who are members of the bank. And so that took a long, so that was part of the delay for the rebuild because, you know, you know, you borrow money from certain, same thing with the, with the um, road project. I think. You, know, you borrow money from the IDB, you have to open up the bidding for all, you know, all member countries. And, um, so, but you must be able to say, you know, this here 
only for uh, Bahamian companies. Uh, approval for direct awards um, uh, addressed in clause 31 must be sought prior to making such an award. So if you want to give an, a, a direct award, of course, there has to be uh, value for money and all that, but you must get approval prior to direct to, um, giving the direct award. You don't award it and then come back looking for approval. Um, clause Clause 43 of the bill seeks to introduce a development preference for uh, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, women-owned businesses, family island businesses, and youth-owned businesses. Under Clause 3, the percentage of the margin of preference as prescribed by the bidding documents may be applied to such businesses. So what happens there, Madam President, in simple terms, is that I think the Americans call it affirmative action. And um, what, what clause 43 of the bill does is it says if um, it is in the it is a policy of the government, the philosophy of the government to promote the growth of small business, to promote the growth of businesses owned by women, promote the growth of family island businesses, and to promote the growth of businesses owned by young people, youth owned businesses. And so what it allows, what this act now allows for, but um, explicitly spells out, because the previous act spoke here as well, I must say, what this specifically spells out is that within a, a contract, you will be able to say that a business owned by a family islander, or a woman or a young person, or a um, small and, and medium-sized business, they will be allowed a, a margin. So another bidder would have to beat them by a certain margin that would be spelled out in the document. So if you say, okay, by nature of a, by virtue of a business being in a family island, their expenses are higher, so they are not quite able to match the price of the business in the Providence, you can say, okay, well, once they are within 25%, 20%, or whatever figure of that business's price, you are still able to grant the contract to that business, either in the family island, women or small, uh, because you are willing to pay a bit more for the good of being able to promote those types of, of ownership in those businesses. And so that is, um, that is um, a very positive um, um, portion of this act, Madam President. And, and friends, I look forward to the day when we can say a certain percentage of all government businesses, all government business, those, you know, family islands, and small, and you really, really make sure, because that's, that's the way we will we'll do it, Madam President, the, um, the market forces will not, will not, market forces, strictly business, government must be able to, must be able to, to assist, must be able to assist. Um, and I'll move quickly now, Madam President, clause 50 of the bill, enables a procuring entity to request that bidders extend the period of effectiveness of their bids. So you can ask them to, um, you know, extend the period of the effectiveness, effectiveness of their bid. Um, clause 51 makes further provision for a procuring entity to, to renegotiate or reject an unsatisfactory bid. So they added two, two sections in there. Um, disqualification, clause 54 of the bill seeks to expand disqualification provisions to allow a bidder to be dis disqualified for a host of bad actions. Um, so, uh, you know, it um, can be disqualified if you're bidding. If you, if you submit false information in your bid or if you offer agrees to give directly or indirectly a gratuity, a, a job offer, or anything of service or value. So you can't do any offer to do any favors or or, or tips, you know, that would um, disqualify you right away. Um, if there's a conflict of interest that's not disclosed, or if, um, you know, there's a violation of, of the communication protocol. So, you know, there's a particular way to go about applying for the, for the bid. Um, and so what it seeks to do is, again, discourage uh, bad behavior. And I think that's uh, very, very positive. 
Um, clause 56 of the bill, as I move closer to the end, Madam President, because I know um, financial bills are not the most riveting of, of debates. Um, <laughs> clause, <laughs> 50, <laughs> clause 56 of the bill ensures the award um, criteria may take into account both financial and non-financial criteria um, and solely financial and non-financial criteria, criteria if disclosed in the bidding document. So what that speaks speak to, Madam President, is you know, sometimes someone might bid a very low price, but they do not demonstrate, and it's quite obvious that those, that person does not have the capability to deliver. Mm -hmm. And so it's not always best to go with the absolute lowest price. Um, and clause 58 of the bill, and now this has been the subject of some uh, public comment, Madam President, uh, 58 of the bill talks about beneficial owners of the company to be published, and um, actually this, um, this, this, um, the first section of this se seeks to correct, um, you know, a situation that happened in the past where there was a there was an obligation to publish in benefits and ownership, and the government did not have the, uh, in hindsight, I suppose, did not have the ability or the legal authority to, to do so, and so uh, that was not done, and that caused a bit of consternation, um, which thankfully has passed. But this bill seeks to correct that. What it says is if you are getting uh, funding from some international organization like the IMF and they require that part of obtaining this money, uh, you publish the beneficial ownership, then this empowers you uh, to do so. And, um, and it, it goes on in section, subsection 3 of that act, of, the, of this act, of this bill, where it says, speaks to, again, the publication of the beneficial ownership information. I think, again, this has been the subject of some questions by the leader of the opposition in, the, the, um, in uh, his, his um, assertion that the government has failed to publish the uh, beneficial ownership of successful bidders. And this bill here uh, specifically provides, it says, notwithstanding any other laws, any successful bidder and each beneficial owner of successful bidder shall be deemed to have consented to the publication of the name of each beneficial owner when accepting the procurement contract. So what it says is, you, um, by the virtue of bidding, if you're successful, um, you, you have given the right to publish your name. And so um, we, we, um, we deal with that matter of, of public publication. Um, personally, um, the, the, um, it's, it's, I, I think it's good that the bill specifically uh, says that by virtue of accepting a contract, you are consenting to the publication because, um, you know, in, in a small society like ours, you know, you have to be a personal opinion. I mean, when I first heard about, um, you know, publishing the names on the road, two things can happen owe somebody money and they see that you've been awarded a contract, they say, well, I see you got that contract, pay me. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> or, unfortunately, it might be a security situation, you know, you don't want yeah. to have a situation where someone's name is published, you got this contract and some criminally minded person says, well, why did that money? So, oh, I can borrow, but, you know, security wise. So, consent is being given and I, I think, um, we know the intent in terms of publication, what the intention is make sure everything is arm length, there's no arm's length, there's no conflict of interest, um, which we think it's, it's, it's a positive um, attribute. Um, the bill finally, um, Madam President, uh, seeks to abolish the Procurement Review Tribunal and provide that appeals by aggrieved persons to now be heard by the existing Tax Appeal Commission. Uh, this is intended to increase administrative burden so you don't have to set up a whole Procurement Review Tribunal. And President, you know, if you ask the, um, the technical people in the ministries, they would say they don't get a lot of formal complaints. People might grumble and say, I didn't, I didn't get that. But actually, when it comes to putting in a formal complaint saying I was treated unfairly, they don't get many. Now that's either because there's a acceptance that the process is fair, or it might be that some people might say, well, what's the use? No, but um, 
they will be able to go before the existing tax appeal tribunal and have their matter heard if they think that they were treated unfairly. Um, the second schedule um, just talks about principles of procurement to be followed by procuring entities and public bodies, and so they include all of the positive attributes of accountability, competitive supply, effectiveness, value for money, fair dealing, integration, um, integrity, informed decision making, legality, responsiveness, and transparency. And I'm president, you know, value for money. I have to tell this story, you know, um, because that is a uh, you know, people, when we talk about securing the public finance, and uh, many people think automatically of someone stealing money or misappropriating funds, but a, a, a very serious problem as well is not getting value for money because the government spends money for a service or, or a good, and um, so you buy a car and it turns out to be a lemon, it's an expense. It's just like stealing money. I remember in case when I was at when I was Minister of State and Finance, and when we had the the um, tenders board, and they would send a, would have the tenders committee, and then they would come up to the minister for approval at a certain level. And I remember one case where someone was hired to repair a section of the, the Clarence Bain building, the roof, and they came back and said that. Because of a tropical storm that had brushed past Nassau, it, it, it blew off, it damaged the work that was in progress. And they needed more money to go back and fix it, right? But then the report says that the quote that was given and the contract that was awarded called for ice and water shield. But the person was using the regular belt. But had it not been for the, for the storm, to interrupt, we would not have known. So we would have paid for ice and water shield, yeah, yeah. but we would have gotten felt. And it was about, you know, in relative terms, you know, maybe $50,000, but, you know, what immediately comes to mind is how much of that has been going on. You know, your government is paying for something and not getting what they pay for, you know, oversight. Um, <laughs> felt cheaper. You get, a, you, get a, you get a bigger profit margin. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it, it occurred to me, and they're sitting there and getting those reports and going through them, and, um, you know, and I, 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 that, I reflected on that when I was thinking about this procurement because I wanted to say, Madam President, and I'll say it at this point, that, you know, when we talk about financial management, procurement, value for money, making sure the government uh, funds are secured, it's not just, I'll see this sitting down there, Ministry of Economic Affairs and the FS. It's all of us. It's all all behind. All behind. We have a duty. We have a duty to make sure that we are we are you're the public citizen, whether it's you're the policeman, so to speak. And um, if you're giving service, make sure you give value for money. And if you are overseeing and any of the agencies responsible for the oversight, make sure that we are getting uh, the value for money. Because the government has gets money from two sources, Madam President, you get it from taxes and fees or you get it from borrowing. And so if the government has to be spending money over and over because it gets uh, substandard services in its procurement or you know, um, construction is done and it's not up to standard and you have to go back and get someone else to do it or if you buy some goods and the poor quality you have to go back and buy, that's just like stealing money uh, from the Treasury. And so it's all our responsibility, Madam President, to protect the assets of the government. Um, Madam President, in terms of the public financial management bill, some of the main elements of this bill, again, this bill um, speaks to how um, government funds are collected and accounted for and how they are spent and it provides for audit and so from the collection to the spending and the accounting for the, for the government money, in a nutshell, the Public uh, Financial Management Act. Madam President, and going hand in hand with the promulgation of this act, with the introduction and passing of this act, is a tremendous investment in IT. Because we have unfortunately had a, um, an IT system with the public service and with the treasury that is old and aged and, um, and obsolete, really. They, they, they don't even uh, fix it anymore, or, you know. And so we have to um, replacing, we're replacing that. Um, we have in place IDB funding, 
um, for the to replace the financial management system. Um, we want to accelerate progress uh, with the implementation of that. Unfortunately, the progress has lagged. Um, as I said, the government payroll system was acquired in 1998, no longer supported. Uh, we need to get a new uh, system. Uh, we have signed, the government has signed an agreement with Oracle to put in place a world-class uh, cloud-based enterprise resource planning application, which will modernize the financial operations of the government at a much lower cost as the vendor is providing both the hardware and the software for this application. So we're changing the system. We've talked about this uh, for a long time and making sure that the system, Ministry of Public Service, Treasury, they're talking to each other so that you don't have delays and things like pensions and, and gratuities, etc. Um, the Act repe repeals and replaces the Public Finance Management Act and it also repeals the Fiscal Responsibility Act and brings it, imports some of the provisions of the Fiscal Responsibility Act into this Act. And um, it incorporates material provisions of the Fiscal Responsibility Act into this uh, consolidated uh, framework. And as well, the remaining provisions of the Financial Administration and Audit Act. Um, a number of new uh, definitions have been have been uh, included. We are going back to the name Treasurer, because uh, I think the name Accountant General did not quite catch on. I mean, we know the Treasurer. The treasurer is the one in charge of, of the payment. So we're going back to the name uh, Treasurer. Uh, in terms of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, um, again, this bill incorporates the general uh, uh, principles of proper, of responsible fiscal management, that is prudence, integrity, transparency, and all. The main, one of the main uh, changes has been that when it comes to the appointment of the Fiscal Responsibility Council. Um, the, in, in the previous act, there were I think five members appointed by uh, ICA, the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants, the Chartered Financial Analyst Society, the University of Bahamas, um, the, the um, uh, Bahamas Law Association, and um, one other. And um, but what this bill uh, seeks to do is to ensure that um, those uh, individuals who are appointed uh, by the Prime Minister does not repeat, well, it does not continue that provision of a member being sent forward by those associations, but allows the Prime Minister to appoint individuals um, who have experience in the yeah, Abar Association, who have um, experience in uh, business and fiscal matters. The bill as well um, sets out to improve the administrative support of the Fiscal Responsibility uh, Council by providing them with uh, support and funding and improve the confidentiality of information and enhance the qualification requirements for council members, as I stated. Um, requiring members to have competence in competence and experience in domestic or international macroeconomic or fiscal matters and allows for a balance of uh, men and women on the council. The bill speaks about um, the, you know, things like the budget reserve appropriation account, uh, which is a, a reserve that would, um, can be tapped into for um, unforeseen expenditure. And so that limit is being raised from 3% to 5%. And it allows for a separate uh, contingencies fund um, it uh, specifically defines what is an unforeseen uh, circumstance and um, the, uh, it deals with, um, it provides for the establishment of the Public Sector Audit Committee with the Auditor General as one of its members and it uh, lays out the qualifications for the qualifications of those members appointed to the committee. And so it uh, as well re it, um, deals with reviewing and, and recommending approval of internal audit reports, auditor general reports, 
uh, recommending and periodically reviewing an internal audit charter for the government for approval by the Auditor General. So we're establishing a uh, public sector audit committee to oversee all, ma oversee all matters related to audit uh, within the uh, public sector. Um, so, um, finally, on that one, Madam President, um, and importantly, Clause 103 of the bill introduces a code of corporate governance to guide the management and oversight of agencies and government business enterprises. So um, you have various uh, boards that, um, and that, that is included in the ninth set. You have various boards that are appointed um, to oversee all number of uh, government agencies. And so in this bill, is included in the ninth schedule, the Code of Corporate Governance, um, and um, you know, talks about their responsibilities and duties, and encourages them to report unlawful behavior, um, not uh, misuse information, not take advantage of their position, etc. So, I think it's very, very useful, and will be presented, extracted from here, and presented to every board that is appointed uh, by the government. Madam President. It is important uh, when it comes to um, the financial legislation, particularly as it relates to reporting and accountability to the Bahamian people, that we are able to have legislation that is effective in carrying out uh, its um, mandate, its intent of promoting accountability, transparency, good governance, integrity, all of those things. But it must be effective. Effectiveness is a good test. And when I say effectiveness, I mean we must be able uh, to implement it uh, without undue, um, I wouldn't say, undue hardship. So we must be able to have laws that you can implement um, that will not, you know, divert so much of the government resources just so you have the form of, of implementation and perhaps the spirit uh, is ignored. And so I think what we're doing here today is we are preserving and in many cases enhancing the transparency and accountability um, character of the legislation that we are presenting. But we are doing it in a way that, particularly in relation to the Public Procurement Bill, promotes the social objective of promoting small business, women-owned businesses, family island-owned businesses, and um, micro businesses, but we are uh, preserving the transparency, the integrity provision that will allow us to do the job that we are here for, part of the legislature, that is to be able to properly, timely, very thorough, uh, transparent manner that everybody can understand, but report to the Bahamian people how their funds are being collected, how their funds are being accounted for, how their funds are being used, and then to give them a report on, on the outcome. And I think what we're doing here today, Madam President, will by make tremendous strides in allowing us to be able to fulfill that obligation, to continue to fulfill that obligation to the Bahamian people. So, Madam President, with those few words, I move for second reading and committal for a bill for an act to repeal and replace the Public Procurement Act to revive. Hmm? Yeah, I just wanted to do this. Yeah. So I move for second reading of a bill for an act to for an act to repeal and replace the Public Procurement Act, revise the framework and procedures public procurement of goods, works, and services to further promote fair and equitable treatment of all suppliers, consultants, and contractors, to further promote competition, transparency, sustainability, and integrity in the public procurement and for connected mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator the Honorable Michael Alkitas, for your contribution. Is there a seconder? I recognize the Senator, the Honorable Darren Fixtoff.
President. Madam President, uh, firstly, uh, welcome back. Um, you were missed indeed, and so it's good to have you back. <laughs> Madam President, I, I would like to, um, to join you uh, in welcoming uh, the students and, uh, and the faculty of the International School of Business, Entrepreneurship and Technology. Uh, welcome to the Senate. I would also I would also like to uh, particularly recognize uh, Mrs. Mitzi Turnquist, uh, who is the Senior Director of Operations at the International School of Business and Entrepreneurship and Technology. Welcome. Madam President, uh, I would like to also join you in uh, recognizing uh, Mrs. Munnings. Madam President, Mrs. Munnings uh, was a positive influence in my life, and I'm sure uh, many can say the same also. Welcome, Mrs. Munnings. I would also <laughs> like to uh, extend uh, my heartfelt condolences uh, to uh, Mr. Ed Bethel, uh, joining you, Madam President, uh, who we all know um, broadcasting uh, career span decades, um, stretching back to pre-independence, and who became a highly regarded Bahamian diplomat. Madam President, I rise to second the compendium of legislation before us today, uh, namely the Public Procurement Bill and the Public Finance Management Bill. The Kilman Bill, as we know, has such a history. Madam President, before I, I go in uh, to uh, my contribution, uh, for the benefit of uh, uh, the students um, and people in the gallery, uh, I would just like to summarize and highlight uh, the purpose of the Kilman Bill uh, 2022 which is to promote fair and equitable treatment of all suppliers, consultants, and contractors in public procurement, and further to promote competition, transparency, sustainability, and integrity in that process. The benefits of the bill to, I would say, the Bahamian people um, is to that promote efficiency and cost-effective procurement processes, increase transparency and accountability, and support for small businesses. It is important that we have good governance, uh, and hence the introduction of this bill, uh, to reduce the risk of com corruption in public procurement, and how the bill promotes this is through principal procurement such as accountability, value for money, fair dealing, and transparency in the procurement process. It is important, extremely important, for members of parliament supporting this bill to work towards the implementation of the betterment of their constituents in the country as a whole. So it would behoove me uh, if we don't have full support in here today. <laughs> Madam President, the Public Procurement Bill aims to promote fair and equitable treatment of all suppliers, consultants, and contractors, and to promote further competition, transparency, sustainability, and integrity in public procurement. The benefits to the Bahamian people, as I mentioned, are greater transparency, the bill seeks to increase transparency in public procurement by introducing an electronic procurement system and requiring all interested parties to register. The system will allow for greater access to information on public procurement processes, making it easier for the public to monitor and scrutinize the procurement process increased competition. 
The bill aims to promote competition by allowing more entities to bid for contracts, creating a level playing field for all bidders. This will encourage innovation and provide better value for money for the Bahamian people. Support for small businesses. This bill introduces a development preference for MSMEs, medium and small business enterprises, women-owned businesses, family island businesses, and youth owned businesses. This will, provide, this will provide these businesses with greater opportunities to secure government contracts and grow their businesses. More efficient procurement process. The bill seeks to streamline the procurement process, reducing administrative burdens and costs. This will enable government entities to procure goods and services more efficiently, ultimately benefiting the Bahamian people by providing faster access to essential services. Enhance accountability. The bill introduces principles of procurement to be followed by procuring entities and public bodies, including accountability, value for money, fair dealings, integrity, and transparency. This will ensure that government entities are held accountable for their procurement decisions, ultimately benefiting the Bahamian people by promoting good governance and reducing the risk of corruption. With that said, uh, Madam President, uh, I reiterate my uh, uh, previous statement, it would behoove me if we don't have full support in here today. Madam President, behind every bad law, there is a fear, there is a deep fear, a poet once wrote some time ago. I thought about this as I reviewed the ep episodic melodrama of the Procurement Act of 2021 because this bill is repealing a previous act, the Procurement Act of 2021, which the former FNM government rushed through Parliament, even as the political death rattle was echoing in their throats in the lead-up to the September 2021 general election. Um, uh, wait to be recognized. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Michael Michael Barnett Ellis. Thank you, Madam President, and welcome back. Uh, I just wanted to correct something that Pre that Senator the Honorable Dan Pickstock said. This legislation was actually <coughs> passed in March of 2021. It came into force in September, but it was actually passed earlier in the year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Senator, uh, stop, please proceed. Sorry, thank you for. Thank you very much for for that uh, for that correction. Uh, I was wondering, uh, if this was passed in March of 2021, but implemented in September of 2021. Is that correct? I think uh, that is correct. It it behooves me the length of time it took the previous administration from debating, passing this act, and then uh, further implementing it for, 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 the, for, for 2022, Madam President, right? It, what it shows, Madam President, uh, uh, it, what it shows. The chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Michael Bonnet. Ellis? Thank you, Madam uh, President. The, the record will show that there are many pieces of legislation that have been passed by both houses of parliament and actually never reenacted. What comes to mind is the legislation about uh, early education centers which codify regulations for nursery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Michael Barnett. Senator, 
Let me hear um, Senator Ruben Rabins. Chair, recognize Senator the Honorable Ruben Ramey. Yes, Madam President, in, in light of uh, Senator Pistock not having objection to the point of water that was originally raised before the last by, um, by uh, the Senator here, he should rephrase the statement that he made with attribute the bill to a directly link to the expediency and the timing of the election, which he characterized as a death rattle. And also in lieu of what he had been articulating in his, um, I think, frivolous attempt to uh, change the matter, what he began to say that the, after the passage of the bill, it took so long before the enactment, which was actually agreed upon at the passing of the bill, which his, uh, the then opposition, which is included former prime minister, also supported. But yet here we have the country waiting 18 months after a law had been enacted and ignored by the current administration. Okay, we, you're months. getting into the debate this now. Part, 18 yeah. months, yeah. the same 18 uh, months on. just to bring yeah. an amendment. So I want him to withdraw Senator, the characterization Senator. that he tried to appear, to make it appear as if there was some lackness in the presentation of that bill. Thank you. Ma thank, Ma you. Ma thank, you Senator, thank you, Senator Ramey. I will not withdraw my statement. One, Madam President, I will, I, I, will, I will demonstrate through my presentation how flawed the act was. Uh, there were, th they couldn't even administer the act. It would take the entire Ministry of Finance, Madam President, the whole staffing to administer the act the way it was done. So I will demonstrate that through my, okay. my, my contribution, Pre Madam President, and I will not withdraw my statement. Received your presentation. We'll come back to that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pickstock. Please proceed. Thank you. Madam President, just for the benefit of, because I, I was distracted earlier, uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, the, the listening public and, and our gallery, I would repeat what I said because I'm double downing. I will double down on what I'm saying. Yeah? Madam President, thank you very much, Madam President. <laughs> Madam President, I thought about this as I reviewed the episodic melodrama of the procurement act of 2021, which the former FNM government rushed through Parliament, even as the political death rattle was echoing in their throats in the lead-up to the September 21, 2021 general election. Madam President, behind every bad law, there is a deep fear. I repeat those words, because these words ought to be something we as legislators always have a reminder, have as a reminder and as our stabilizer in the ordinary course of what we do. Madam President, we legislate. We are here today, Madam President, to repeal a compendium of legislation known as the Procurement Act of 2021 and to replace and repeal it with the Procurement Bill of 2023. The Procurement Bill 2023 was foreshadowed in the speech from the throne in October of 2021 by the New Day government, led by the Honorable Prime Minister Philip Davis, and the return of the Progressive Liberal Party to governance after a four-year hiatus. For those young current affairs students watching this debate, the speech from the throne is a major feature at the opening of Parliament after or after the dissolution of the House of Assembly. His Excellency, the Governor General, Head of State, reads the speech from the throne, which is prepared by the new government. In that speech, the government outlines its major plans and legislative focus for its term in office. The New Day government, PLP government that is, in the speech from the throne, served notice that the Procurement Act of 2021 
would be replaced and repealed. The promise was made that the new legislation would be reflective of the country and advance openness and exciting new opportunities for Bahamians to do business with their government. Madam President, in an atmosphere of political cynicism and where the electorate have been jolted with the conduct of stop, cancel and review, another desperate unhinged f and policy, it became fiercely incumbent on the new day government to present its case as to why the, the F&M's procurement bill of 2021 needed to see the dustbins of history. Before I go further into my contribution, Madam President, let me again remind the Bahamian people that the very nature, fiber, and substance of the procurement facilities with the government and any government in office is very big business. Governments need goods and services in order, to, uh, in order for the country to run properly and the modernization and efficiency of the state to remain at the most highest and optimum levels. Therefore, a procurement act is needed which reflects the ethos and the realities and standards of the Bahamas and how the government earn its revenue to pay for goods and services. The country needs a procurement act which levels the playing field for every Bahamian worthy of hire and to be able to engage in the bidding and the procurement process as laid out in the rules. Madam President, there is a very important observation to be made about the anomalous of the FNM's Procurement Act, which is being repealed here today. It is this, Madam President. The FNM passed their bill into law with the caveat that it would go into effect in a period which followed a snap general election. Uh, Senator, um, I just want to make an intervention here. Can you refer to the previous administration and not the FNM? Thank yes, you. Madam. Previous administration? Yes, the previous administration. Thank you. I, I will repeat that, Madam President. It is this, Madam President. The previous administration passed their bill into law with the caveat that it would go in effect in a period which followed a SNAP general election. We know that SNAP general election was in September of 2021, which with much fanfare and glitzy public relations bravado, the previous government trotted out with procurement, with the procurement act, their procurement, their procurement act. Alas, they were great pretenders, Madam President, pretending to be what they were not. Great pretenders. They wanted to hoodwink and run amok through the country with this claim about corruption and dishonesty in previous governments. To boast that their hands were so clean, would, would the facts disclose there were some who had their hands, Madam President, in the cookie jar? Chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Darren Fanfield. What is your point of order, Honorable please? Honorable the member is misleading. Um, there are several members of the past administration currently before the courts. The courts have not yet ruled on any of the allegations before them. So for the member to say that there were members with their hands in the cookie jar is obviously very wrong. And you ought to withdraw that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator the Honorable. Darren Fanfield. Senator the Honorable, quick stock. Do um, you have anything to table with respect to the statement of hands being in the cookie jar well, and being very cautious and being very mindful of the fact that there are matters before the court which is sub judice? Yes, Madam President, I, I, I didn't name anyone who had their hands in the cookie jar. I just said that there were members with their hands in the cookie jar, Madam President. I didn't say anything. Mm. Yeah, that is um, kind of improper imputation. Madam President, I will withdraw my cookie jar uh, statement. 
Uh, thank you so much, Senator, uh, for withdrawing that from the record. Uh, please proceed. Thank, thank you. you. Madam, President. Right. Madam President, the nation would soon discover why the f and procurement act was just puppet theater, a remake of all other performances of the previous government, which earned no stars, no favorable reviews, and crates of rock rotten tomatoes, Madam President. It has been suggested that the FLM held back on its own poly frame procurement act because of what we learned transpired at the Department of Beaches and Parks and Playgrounds. It has been suggested, Madam President, that the previous administration held back on its own poly frame procurement act because of lavish, luxurious furnishing for the bravado of overseas foreign missions. Madam President, it has been suggested that the FNM held back on its own poly frame procurement act 2021 to slow down public concerns as to why a private company with fiduciary links to powerful one-man band entities needed to account for the COVID passport's money. Or was it the fees another private company was collecting for police records? Or was it the contracts at the Ministry of Sports? Or was it the contracts at other public corporations? Or was it the food program that was pumping millions of dollars into the pockets of those connected to the f and and their cronies? Or was it to conceal an international... The, 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 members, the member, Madam President... Wait, wait, wait to be recognized, please. The chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Darren Henfield. And what is your point of order, please? The members, the members must be meeting. The member has just stood on his feet in this place and said that the food program pumped millions of dollars into the pockets of f and supporters. And unless he's prepared to name those supporters, how, much, how many millions of dollars went into their po specific pockets, he ought to withdraw. Thank you for your intervention, Senator Henfield. Senator Pickstock, no. uh, can, you, can you restate what you, just said, what you just said about the food program, please? I just want to make sure that he has the accurate statement. Madam President, I said, or was it the food program that was pumping millions into the pockets of those persons connected to the previous administration? Madam President? Uh, do you ha is the intention here to lay documents to support that statement, Senator Pixel? Madam President, it's, it's, this is in the public domain, right? This is, it, this is information in the public domain uh, it, it's, it's, okay, it's, it's an the information is in the public domain. Uh, do you have information? Do you have documents to support support your your position? Madam since President, you said it's in the public domain, Madam President, I think documents may have been tabled in that other place. Okay. Um, uh, I, I have no documents with me, Madam okay. President. So until such time, mm -hmm. until I can provide the report, uh, which is in the public domain that demonstrates that the food program was flawed, uh, I would withdraw my statement on that particular point. Thank you. Thank you, Senator the Honorable Darren Pickstock. Senator, is there? Thank you. Please proceed, Senator the Honorable Darren. Or, Madam President, was it to conceal the international aid which the f and was, was pledged to the which, which the previous administration said was pledged to the country in the aftermath of Dorian, allegedly. Just what was it that the f and needed to conceal and hide and bury and camouflage from the Bahamian people? There are some who think the f and was not ever really serious about their procurement. Act. It was all a sleight of hand, like the Oban contract signing, might I say, Madam President, I repeat, behind every bad law, there is a deep fail. The poetic reminds us. The poet reminds us, I beg your pardon. And so it, and so it, remind, it remained incumbent on, the Prime Minister, on Prime Minister Davis to make the case as to why the FNM's Procurement Act could not cut the mustard. It, remi it remained incumbent on the PLP Prime Minister to convince and prove, the prove to the nation and the Bohemian people and the world at large that this promise in the speech from the throne 
to repeal and replace the FNM Act, the previous administration act, was not stop, cancel, and review. This was a bad piece of legislation which needed to be taken to the shredder, Madam President. <laughs> this was the right thing to do because the previous administration's procurement act was seriously and fatally flawed in so many fundamental ways, Madam President. Indeed, the Prime Minister went as far to say that the FNM's procurement act, if left to stand, would result in serious embarrassment for the Bahamas. The term the Prime Minister used in describing the FNM Act was unworkable. Out of order. Madam President, you... you the Chair recognizes the Senator the Honorable I'm, I'm, Darren Hendrick. You, you, you have right admonished ahead. this member. Uh, don't to, put to words in my mouth now, Senator. Okay. Watch it. Okay. <laughs> the, the member's misleading, right? He's been admonished by, by the President. I said, don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> this from, from referring to this as an F&M administration yeah. act. Well, that's, that's true. In, in fact, the, the act passed the other place unanimously, mm. without objection from the current administration. Um, in fact, all of your members present voted for it. And so to continue to call it a, an F&M administration act, it, it, it is... It is, it is behemoth legislation is what it is. Yes, thank you. Which, which we're about now to, to remove. To support. Right? Mm. Thank you, Senator Hanfield, for your intervention. Uh, Senator Pickstock, can we please proceed along the lines that I'd want to you earlier with respect to your reference to... Uh, let's let, I, I think that it's better if we, if we um, use the term previous government. Now, if you want to define the government, that's fine, but to define it as f and M, I, I, well, I, Madam that President, is not I, the, the way I think we want to go. Yes. No, okay. I, 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 I accept that, Madam mm -hmm. President, and uh, I am moving along uh, those lines, uh, but every now and then, my text highlights that word, and so I, you know, I, I, I quickly, <laughs> I, I quickly pivot, Madam President, um, but uh, the... Just remember to make the correction, please, Senator yeah. Fixta. Because we don't want... Honorable Absolutely. No, they're, they're my friends. I don't want to... Absolutely. Absolutely. Madam, Madam, Madam President, uh, uh, Senator the Honorable Darren Henfield uh, uh, indicated that the legislation passed unanimously in that other place. Um, I hope the same uh, will be done here. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, please proceed, Senator Bigstar. Thank the you. The Prime Minister described the previous administration's act as unworkable. He said it prevented timely reporting and ultimately could have serious, seriously damaged the reputation of the country. The Prime Minister said, and I quote, It is this administration's mandate to be forthright and actually reform financial planning processes with this country, within this country. We have been burdened by a compendium of legislation on critical functions of government which is simply unworkable, either by sins of omission or commission. The fact that they were clueless regarding implementation is confirmed by the paucity of background information with respect to drafting the legislation without which this relevant background information. It is nearly impossible to understand the reason for many of the clauses in the legislation and how it is supposed to work in the Bahamian context. End quote from the Prime Minister. Madam President, the Prime Minister was eloquent, firm, and determined in building his case for the repeal of the previous administration's sponsored procurement act. In that other place, the only line of defense that came from those who sat around the previous administration's table 
and pass this basically worthless piece of legislation is the current government did not consult special interest groups or organizations as to the direction of a new procurement act or the direction that a new procurement act would take. Not one of them, after listening to the scholarly presentation of the member of Cat Island and R Rumke at San Salvador, dare answer with a legal retort. Nobody move, Madam President. Nobody get intellectually hurt. Madam President, the King's Council took his time and in a commendable and brilliant dissertation on the stagnation of the previous administration's procurement act 2021 and he proved to the nation that the procurement act of 2021 was as they say in this multicultural society kaboom madam president madam president i wish to visit the dissertation of the honorable prime minister because the weight of his arguments must be continuously advanced for the edification of the Bohemian people and for the utmost certain clarity of the Bohemian people in understanding the new benefits and opportunities accrued to them on the level playing field of the bill before us today. Madam President, the Honorable Prime Minister called the FNM Procurement Act, the previous administration's Procurement Act, I beg your pardon, Madam President, and I quote, a strange act in the context of the Bahamas and it, as it ignores the structural imbalance in our economy, an imbalance which the government is obligated to correct." End quote. <coughs> Madam President, the most frightening and damning condemnation of the Procurement Act 2021 is that it seeks to once again empower exclusivity to a special class of super wealthy, well-connected, well-connected people in the previous administration's power base. As to an open invitation to such persons to receive most highly favored status in bidding on government contracts for goods and services. Madam President, it needs to be pointed out that this most egregious condition seem to magnetize and maximize huge profits to one very well-placed business operation in the food industry, who pocketed gazillions of dollars of the FNM's food program, I beg your pardon, Madam President, of the food program during the COVID pandemic. Madam President. The Chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Ruben Ramming. Can you please state your point of order? Yes, my point of order is unless the, and we do have the finance minister here, is able to present any other document other than that that has been tabled in this upper and lower house as it relates to the food program. Again, the current Senator Pistol is blatantly misleading, overreaching, and misrepresenting and disparaging NGOs that have been very beneficial to this country before COVID, during COVID and after. There is no single, uh, there is no, and this is the report here, this is the table right here. Oh, okay, uh, okay, uh, Senator. If, if I may, if I may, mm -hmm. there is no single entity, as he stated, he just said, a single large company. And then uh, it, it is rather juvenile of us to be using <coughs> words like a zillion, unmeasurable words, to disparage entity. The report that was listed here and presented to the House of Assembly uh, and the uh, Senate, the A. TI company, uh, which spoke about the procedures that was used in the audited review, clearly also made itself clear in the document that uh, use of this report is restricted to the ministry and all other parties will be excluded from using the report. This is the only time to report as it relates to that. And he's disparaging that. And it's clearly outlined, as we know, that there were numerous NGOs, NGOs, not individuals that was involved in the same program. And I wish he would withdraw that and stop disparaging until such time as something tangible has been presented, the reputation of these NGOs.
Thank you, Senator the Honorable Reuben Ramming. Senator the Honorable Darren Pickstaw. Uh, Madam President, um, I, I, um, I, I don't understand the point of order. One. Uh, two. Um, is the, is the, Madam President, I'm directing my comments to you. Uh, is the uh, member uh, tabling uh, the report? Or has it been tabled? Okay. Senator the Honorable. Has already been tabled and displayed and debated. This is the exact copy provided from here. And it's what on is the what record. Re what re um. I, I already established it. What, what this is the agreed. You saying that this report with respect to the National Fuel distri uh, Distribution Tax Force Agreement upon procedure report. It's the only report that is being tabled in the House and the lower house as an accusation related to the food task force and anything related to the distribution of food to the COVID and the COVID administration. And this is tabled right here. When was the table, Senator? Table, I have the document. Um, Senator Alkidis tabled it. He can verify it. Here's a copy, hard copy of it. It's right here. Do you wish to table? Um, it's already tabled. I'm just saying he's doubting that it's been tabled. I'm showing a document that is tabled and debated, and it can be easily verified, as I always say, talk to the senior man next to you. Okay, thank you, Senator. There it is. Thank, thank you, Senator Rem. This is my have copy. Have, 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 have a seat. Uh, Senator Fixar, yes. could you me. provide some clarification on your statement, please? Madam President, um, the member opposite uh, indicated clearly that the report was tabled. Um, and he indicated that I must refer to my senior. Um, but, but, Madam President. So I think that with the, the, the statement you made with respect to the NGOs and the food dis distri well, Madam distribution, President. that is what he's disputing. Madam President, right? the Prime Minister in that other place, and this is public record. The Prime Minister in that other place, uh, and, and who is also the Minister of Finance, Madam President, uh, Prime Minister the Honorable Philip Davis, revealed new details about the pandemic food program under the previous administration while contributing to the mid-year budget debate, Madam President. Okay? He told parliamentarians, Madam President, uh, of organizations returning unused funds returning 100,000 in cash, certain people, I'm not done. And he still got more to bring. He was referring to, to other individuals in the House, Madam President, during the mid-year budget. So this is public Wait, information, let me, let me, and I'm not hear, done with what I'm saying. Let me hear. Further, Madam President, I don't know where he bought anything back yet as I speak. This is what the, what the Prime Minister is saying, Madam President. He informed us of a company engaged under the previous administration to collect immigration fees under the exclusive contract. Every person, well, with respect to the food, uh, Mr. Davis also indicated, uh, Madam President, as it relates to the food program, that the company did not turn over the monies collected, okay. Madam President. Approximately six point four million dollars, Madam okay. President. Uh, I, I'm well able to rule on this, uh, Senator Pickstock. Yes, do ma'am. we have the Do we have a copy of the speech from the other place that you wish to table? Well, Madam President, I, I don't Pardon? have a copy of that speech with me, Madam President. But Madam President, I undertake because I, I, I hasten to say, Madam President, that this was the Prime Minister's contribution. Okay. to the mid-year budget, uh, Madam President, where he discussed the food program, Madam President, and he made it very, very clear, Madam okay. President. Um, Senator Pickstock, are you giving an undertaking that you would... I, I, I would, Madam President, I would, uh, I would uh, uh, send no. this and bring this before, the, before the, the Senate, Madam President. I would table what I'm reading. I would give you some discretion to um, give the undertaking because you're quoting the Prime Minister? Absolutely. So I expect to have that. And it's only because you're quoting the Prime Minister. Yes. Okay. Madam President, uh, as soon as I take my seat, and I'm I need going you to, to adopt those words as your own. Please. Yes. I, I'm going to table this, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Madam President, here again. Sorry, the current Prime Minister. That, that is absolutely correct, Madam President. Oh, Madam President, I, I take... I, I no, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, no. I say it, it is public record. We've seen it as the Prime Minister. Of the, and I, I admire him for that. Uh, excuse me, you're not, you've not been Acknowledge recognized, um, Senator Rami. Senator Pixar, can you please proceed? Madam President, uh, uh, I would ask uh, uh, Senator the Honorable Ruben Rami, Madam President, to withdraw the statement he just made. Um, uh, in this uh, place, Madam President, um, uh, speaking. Oh, uh, it's been. I, I, I would order that it's been struck from the record because it has no bearing on what we are debating. Please proceed. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, you, Madam President, um, for for um, you know well, not acknowledging that statement. statement. So it's been struck from the record. He was not Madam prepared. President, here again, the Prime Minister sh showed cause and case why the Procurement Act needed to be shredded. Because the previous administration and Prime Minister wrapped himself in lily-white cloths of honesty while he traversed the world telling outsiders about the corrupt governments in this country. It becomes very evident that the former Prime Minister, having drunk his own Kool-Aid, had absolutely no clue as to the ideology and pragmatism behind his flawed legislation. Somebody said, watch out when the pot called the cattle black. Madam President, and so the Bahamian people got brushed with a most unfair characterization. Public officers were blemished. Yet, right before the previous Prime Minister's very eyes, his Minister of Finance was gone. His Minister of Youth and Sports and Culture was gone. What Shaggy say? It was in me, Madam President. Madam President, we heard so much about the term competent authority. Many believe it to be the single embodiment of the previous administration culture of a one-man band. We saw this in the previous administration's procurement legislation, which again made the previous Prime Minister a one-man band. All power given to the previous Prime Minister. Under the procurement bill before us today, Madam President, such powers are vested in the Minister of Finance, not the head of government. <coughs> the bidding process which the previous administration set out to achieve created roadblocks, curfews, security challenges, and hurdles for ordinary Bohemian businesses, persons wanting to do business of procurement with their government. The previous administration called for huge astronomical fees, which could be forfeited just to pick up the bidding documents. More loopholes to jump through than a kid's bowl of breakfast fruit loop cereals, Madam President. Madam President, I make no apologies for my findings. The previous government is made up of two camps, the haves and the have-nots. Strangely, the have-nots are mostly comfortable, on their knees, happy for the haves to have it all, while the have-nots wait for the crumbs of the table. So, the haves get to manage, apolog apologies, did I say mismanage, Madam President, the multi-million dollar food program. The haves collect the COVID passport and police record fees. The haves simply have it all. Their monopolies are protected. Competition is chased away by the strong arm of control. Chair, recognize Senator the Honorable Darren Hanfield. What is your point of order? The, the member is making serious imputations toward legitimate business operations and companies and farmers, which, which are, are, are unbecoming, really, in, in a place like this. The imputations that he makes is, is of some corruption, some illegality, and that, I think that's wrong. Thank you for your intervention. Senator Pickstock, um, you, 
the previous statement that, that you just recently made with respect to NGOs, etc. That, 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 that was in towards NGOs. That was... Uh, I was just, uh, I was uh, talking about the haves and the have not, Madam President. Can you repeat that, that um, statement for me, please? Just one uh, of... Surely I, I, I can repeat that statement. Madam President, Madam President, uh, I said previously, and let me repeat this, and I make no apologies for my findings, Madam President. The FNM is made up of two camps, the haves and the have-nots. Strangely, the have-nots are mostly comfortable on their knees, happy for the haves to have it all, while the have-nots wait for the crumbs off the table. So, the have... Right, I'm listening. I just... Yes. Right, right. Somebody's finished. Yeah. So, the haves get to manage. I apologize. Let, let, me, let me hear the speaker who's, I apologize. The, the senator who's on his feet, please. Did, did I say mismanage the multi-million dollar you, food program? Repeat that last, the few last words there, please. The haves... So, the haves get to manage. Uh, I apologize. Did I say mismanage, Madam President? The multi-million dollar food program... The haves collect the COVID passport and police record fees. The haves simply have it all, Madam President. Their monopolies are protected. Competition is chased away by the strong arm of control. Uh, excuse me. Stop there. Um, Senator Hanfield, that seems like an opinion to me that he's presenting to the debate. Yeah, that seems like his, his opinion. Uh, okay. that, no, he didn't. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, one, one second. Just let me clarify this. Did you take your seat, please? Take your seat. I'm going to get to you in just a second. No, 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 no. Just Sandra Ramming, just give me Sandra Ramming, just give me a second. Just, just give me a second, Sandra Ramming. Let, let's get the record corrected. Senator, Senator, pick stop. Did you previously state? Did you previously state that the reference to the previous government with respect to the House? Did you did you say that in your statement? I think that's the crux of the issue here. Uh, Madam President, if I... No. Okay. I said the previous administration. No, no. Listen. Senator Ramming, I'm going to come to you in just a second. I'm going to come to you in just a second. No, no, no. Madam, Madam President, every time I come, make my, I'm making my contribution. Obviously, I have um, the party spelt out um, in my contribution. However, Madam President, uh, on your advisement um, and instructions, I changed that to say previous administration. And that's what I, I've been saying. Now, I didn't, mean, when I say the haves and the have-nots, I, I didn't uh, specifically point to uh, any named individual or entity, Madam President. I, I'm simply stating my opinion here, Madam okay. President. Okay. All right. I think the record has been has been clarified with respect to who you were referring to. I want to come to you in just a second. I'm going to come to you in just a second. Uh, thank you, Senator. Because just let me hear from Senator Ruben Ramming, please. Um, Senator Ruben Ramming. Said, about the FNM, and even if he followed your, he your, 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 your order, I, I, I'm speaking, even, if I, mm -hmm. if, even if he did follow your instructions and refer to um, the former administration, I dare not to even say from even a governmental policy, you would even see anything that someone could say factually that a government fundamentally, where he could come to evidence or hear it as a confession that any government pay this for the haves and the have not. And definitely from the pre-national movement perspective, there is no way he can say in an opinion or anything in any categorical way that there is a policy or structure, just like both political parties has a constitution, and nowhere in it no one can find any evidence of anyone having a two-party or two-club or two-section system 
where they are the haves and the have not. It's, 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 but the opinion, 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 can, opinion against fact, opinion against a fact is still wrong. No. I can have an opinion that a he is a she, but I don't change who he is. And you cannot stand up, you cannot stand up and say that is. You cannot stand on the record. No, no, no. No, because that also goes fundamentally against the nature even of us as human people. He cannot establish it. He cannot establish it. Senator Ramming? Senator Ramming? He cannot, he cannot establish it. Senator Ramming? Senator Ramming? In debates, we are entitled to opinions once they're not on parliamentary. Uh, Senator Vixar, can you please proceed? Surely. Madam President, I would say one thing before I proceed, that Senator Ramming, S Senator Ramming must have been living under a rock for the past many years. That is unparliamentary. Yeah, Senator Pickstock, please Madam withdraw President, that comment with respect to Senator Ramming. I, I withdraw uh, that statement. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Please and proceed President, with the debate. Thank you. Madam President, the procurement bill before us today uh, is to replace the previous administration's um, aversion create special areas of affirmative economic participation. Madam President, Clause 43 of the bill seeks to introduce a development preference uh, to MSMEs, women-owned women businesses, family island-owned businesses, and youth-owned businesses. Under Clause 43, the percentage of the margin of preference as prescribed by the bidding documents may be applied to such businesses, Madam President. Madam President, this is revolutionary. We are moving away from the colonial mindset which says kiss go by favors. In the New Day, Bahamas, you don't have to kiss anything. Just apply, follow the protocols, dot your I's, and cross your T's, Madam President. Don't come half-stepping. Do your due diligence. Acquire a business attitude. Leave the petty shop mentality in the petty shop. Be honest. Be honest. Deliver on your contract. Find the finances to do so. Get a relationship going with your bankers. Make sure that on the trans transatlantic delivery of a good or service, your supplier is legit, honest, and honorable. Don't do business with suppliers you only met online and have no personal relationship with, because you will get swing, Madam President. Yeah. Madam President, this is an exciting period. The contractor in Black Point Exuma gets to be considered for procurement work in his or her settlement over the competitor from another island. Madam President, there is this anomaly in certain islands today where commercial businesses are owned and operated by persons from other islands. The locals have not had the capacity to organize and the big dollars of entrenched businesses just move in and take over. Yes, we say these are behemoths, but if we want to achieve equity, the girl in Georgetown Exuma should be able to participate in her local economy as a preference over the money elite from the other islands. But that, Madam President, is a debate for another day. Madam President, the bill before us today seeks to change the Public Procurement Act 2022. The bill seeks to repeal and replace the Public Procurement Act of 2021, number seven of 2021 existing act. A number of new definitions have been added to the interpretive provisions of this act. In clause three of the bill, seeks to exclude additional areas which are not due to their nature procured. The additional excluded areas are the financial consultancy in relation to public debt, audit services, contracts entered by government in support of or pursuant to an international treaty, accord or convention, or other international multilateral agreements an agreement between the government and an international funding agency whose procurement rules are mandatorily applied to any procurement contracts, partially 
or wholly funded by monies loaned or advanced pursuant to such an agreement. Madam President, one can appreciate the heavy lifting and the yeoman's thinking and study which went into the bill before us today. The draft persons here understand the Bahamian government fiscal realities. They understand the vagaries of how the Bahamian government must go about the business of contracting for goods and services. The bill has reached us in a proper stage of our approval. The government has acquired the reputable Go Bonfire, a best-in-class procurement platform. This platform is also being used by the Public Hospitals Authority. Already the use of the platform has shown beneficial results and savings to the public purse. As in all foundational legislation, Madam President, there will be amendments over time. We will have to see how the bill works in action and in law. There are, there are new facets of the bill which give the board and the procurement agencies of the government latitude for efficiency. Madam President, the former government was derelict in their act in giving any semblance of protection to public officers who work in the area of procurement from overzealous personalities. It must be a fresh wind is blowing again in the Ministry of Finance and its agencies as the New Day government sink its teeth into the public procurement management bill. Public. <laughs> Madam President, the government is now Madam, Madam President, the government is now processing promotions for finance and accounts offices, a process which last took place when the PLP was in office in 2016. There is an earnest effort of this government to see that the technical officers in the procurement division have equity with their counterparts in finance, Madam President. Madam President, I would like to just uh, pivot uh, just a bit to the um, Public Finance Management Bill, and I know uh, Senator the Honorable Michael Alkidas has addressed this uh, in detail. Um, so, so did the Prime Minister and other ministers in that other place, Madam President. But Madam President, while the previous administration in office snoozed, the technical apparatus of the finance Seidel went to hell on a roller coaster. Despite having met in place an IDB grant to replace the financial management system, the current government returns to office after four years and discovered nothing has been done. Madam President, let me quote the Prime Minister in that other place. We took the necessary steps to ensure ratification of salaries of finance and account officers, a critical step which was overlooked by our predecessors in office. This administration also has created the post of Accountant General in the Public Service, as this was overlooked when the existing Act came into force." End quote. Madam President, much heavy lifting without breaking a sweat, not one utterance of fatigue or grandiose bragging and brash or insolent conduct. I am proud of the Davis Cooper-led administration, but there is much more work to be done, Madam President. Madam President, the payroll system of the government was left unattended to by the previous administration. In fact, the system which should have been changed is running on hardware no longer supported by the manufacturer. The government has now put in place with Oracle a renowned global cooperation, its enterprises resource planning, Madam President. Madam President, for a very long time in our country, there has existed this perception that kisses go by favors. This perception that the well-connected had the connections to stay connected. And those on the outside could complain or explain as loudly as they wish, but certain areas of business in the country, and in particular, doing, doing business with the government was out of their ballpark. For even longer periods of time, 
We have heard of rumors of executives in public agencies forming their own companies and using positions to award contract to enterprises of which the official in the state-related enterprise by reason of his job exercised such influence. The archives of the newspapers and public records are replete, Madam President, with instances where such abuses caused executives to run afoul of the law and suffer penal consequences. Madam President, the government of the Bahamas must close those gaps, and they are doing just that, on certain improper irregularities, and send a strong message to all and sundry that the business of doing business with the government of the Bahamas is very serious business, Madam President. We are on a new road, in a new day, in this, our 50th year of independence. The time and anniversary and weight of the event and the achievement demands of all of us a new selflessness commitment or selfless commitment to build nation and people. Generations to come after us will hail and salute what we do here today to pass this procurement bill 2023 into law and bring about the changes under the, Madam President, the financial legislation. Madam President, we have to resolve to get it right at all times for the Bahamian people. Madam President, I thank you. Thank you, Senator the Honorable Darren Pickstock. It has been moved and seconded that the following bill that the following bill It has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read a second time and committed. A bill for an act to repeal and replace the Public Procurement Act to revise the framework and procedures for the public procurement of goods, works, and services to further promote fair and equitable treatment of all suppliers, consultants, and contractors to further promote competition transparency, sustainability, and integrity in public procurement and for connected matters. As many, the Chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Michael Bonnet Ellis. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, it is once again a pleasure to ride in this most honorable chamber, and I am I have continued gratitude to the Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Michael C. Pintard, for his confidence in me and my ability to hold their feet to the fire on behalf of the people of the Bahamas. I know the students have uh, left, um, Madam President, but I wanted to welcome the students from the International School of Business, Entrepreneurship, and Technology. I had the opportunity to talk with them before this uh, sitting and we were looking at some of the, the paintings around the chambers and they asked some very provocative questions. And I just want to say to Mrs. Munnings as well, her granddaughters, I, they are dynamic young women um, and I'm always, pleased to, I'm always pleased to see that. Madam President, we rise today to talk about two substantial pieces of legislation. The Public Procurement Bill of 2022 and the Public Finance Management Bill 2023. Madam President, these bills are collectively over 170 pages long, and it does them a disservice to debate them together as a compendium. The implications of public procurement and public finance legislation are of significant importance to the Bahamian people. Both of these activities, that's public procurement and public finance, are a reflection of the government's transparency and accountability when it acts on behalf of the Bahamian people. 
In, the, in March of 2021, the former administration debated and passed the Public Procurement Act. The act was hailed as a significant achievement as it brought transparency to the procurement of goods and services on behalf of the Bahamian government. I've listened to the contributions of my fellow Senator, Mr. Darren Pickstock. He used very strong language to talk about the quality of the legislation. In fact, at one point he called it worthless and unworkable. This legislation was drafted by the hard-working, experienced drafters in the office of the Attorney General. And while, no they didn't, while the parties may have different policies, governments are continuous. And it is inappropriate to discredit the quality of their work product done by public, the public servants who drafted this legislation. Without, without any logical reason, or rather for reasons which remain unclear to a great many of us, this administration has failed to comply with the Public Procurement Act. They have failed to follow the statute law of the Bahamas, and they have admitted it. He knows that he knows I'm right. Madam President, it is unheard of that a it is unheard of that a legitimate government would knowingly and deliberately fail to conduct itself in accordance with the laws of the Bahamas. The Madam President, I, I stand on a point of clarification. Um, yes, uh Chair, can I send it to the Honorable Darren Pickstar? Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, the Honorable uh, uh, Senator is, is, is misleading um, uh, the House. Madam President, when the uh, current administration uh, came into uh, governance, they made it very clear that the Procurement Act would be repealed. And the reason it would be repealed was because it was unworkable and it was not they couldn't administer it. Even under the previous administration, even though the act was passed, they never administered it because it was to come so and what is, what is your What is your point of order? The point is, mm -hmm. see, the, the, the Honorable Senator... Uh, Pardon me? The, the, the Honorable Senator, Madam President, uh, indicated that the current administration never adhere. They were in breach of the legislation. Right, Madam President, the government. Uh, if y'all, please, please, I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow the senator. If you can just go ahead, Senator Bixler, please. The the honourable senator, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Anna Ellis, mm -hmm. indicated that the, the current government was in breach of the procurement act. Okay. And my my clarification was the government made it very clear that they were not, uh, and they gave reasons why they were not following that procurement act, because it was, in effect, uh, un unadministerable, one, okay. unworkable, Madam President, right? And so what I'm trying to highlight is even the previous administration did not adhere or administer the procurement act. Yeah, exactly. They did not, Madam President. And so the point is, they, 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 they did not know how the act worked because they passed it and they never followed it. Okay. Right? right? And uh, excuse me, excuse me. Please don't let's interrupt senators when they're speaking. Are you, thank you, thank you, Senator Pickstock. Senator Barnett Ellis, can you please proceed? Thank you, Madam President. You know, Madam President, I'm, I'm very disappointed that my learned friend would raise such a point being a member of the honorable bar in this country because Statute Law 101 says as long as an act is in force, it is valid. If the government had repealed the act when they determined it was unworkable, but the Public Procurement Act at this very moment remains, remains in force, 
and by their own admission, they have not complied with the act. Madam President, Madam President, I have a point of order. Uh, let me ask uh, Senator Baron Griffey. Yep. Griffin, I please proceed with your point of order. I, I have a point of order on the same on the same model, but a slightly order. different point. My point is that um, what um, the Honorable Senator has said is wrong and inaccurate. She said that the government um, purposefully, knowingly, deliberately evaded the law. That is not the case. The government has stated that the law is unworkable, and the fact that the government um, um, on many times tried to work within the limits of the law but filed late reports showed that they did not deliberately evade the law, but, but the fact that their um, reports were late shows the government's suggestion that the, that the legislation was unworkable. So the exact statement that she made is factually incorrect. The government did not deliberately evade the law. Uh, Senator, I can only go on her statement. Yes, Senator Barnett Ellis, you made the prior statement that the government evaded the law. Is that what you said no, previously? No, milady. Uh, Madam President, Ma sorry, wrong, wrong I'm place. My apologies. I'm, 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 I'm promoting you to other places. <laughs> my, my apologies, Madam President. Can, can you, yeah, can you I just said repeat what you said previously? I said it yes, is unheard of you. that a legitimate government would knowing and deliberately fail to conduct itself in accordance with the laws of the Bahamas. <laughs> yes, yes. So, if I, if I, if I make... My, my, my... Wait, wait, just let me hear the second point she's making, yes? Sorry, thank you, Madam President. In my presentation, I will point out the area of the law that the government has not complied with. And the point that I will point to is a point that would have been very easy for them to comply with. And I also repeat my point. Public Procurement Act remains a valid law of the Bahamas at this very moment. The comments by my fellow senators. Okay, thank you. Just let me let me let me let me clarify. As a senator, the honourable let me let me, let me clarify my, my point. My point of order is in relation to the words of her using knowingly and deliberately not following the law, evading the law, however she wants to characterize it. But my point is, she cannot characterize the government as knowingly and deliberately evading the law. She can point to a ministerial statement where a member of the government has said that they knowingly and deliberately did not follow the law, then she can follow. But that has not been produced by the government of the Bahamas. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Barry Griffin. Senator Barnett Ellis, Thank you. the point you made with respect yes. to the government failing to yes. the, uh, the fa failing, failing to follow the law, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he said deliberate. Is, is that what you said? Yes. Madam, Madam President, the Public Procurement Act requires that once contracts are awarded, they are published within 60 days. That has not been complied with. So you're referring to certain aspects of the... Wait, 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 one, one, let me, let me hear from one person at a time, because I, I just want to, um... I was addressing the point in which Senator Barry Griffin asked, point to an example of the government not complying and knowingly and willingly... No, no, he didn't ask that, he didn't ask that, he didn't ask that. But I gave an example, Madam President, of the incident, of a component in this current legislation, that has not been complied with by... Yeah, th I, that's, not, that's not the point what, what the senator is making. What the senator is saying is that... I'm not sure if you're trying to phrase it as your opinion, right? That the government has failed to follow the legislation. The government has failed to... Madam Sorry, President. If, if Madam President, just to finish her statement. No, I'm so almost finished. I just want to hear what he has to say. If, if, I, if I'll clarify again. The senator making the assertion that the government has failed to comply is one thing. That's fine. She mm -hmm. can make that. What I'm saying is she cannot make the statement that the government knowingly and deliberately failed to do so. So but unless there's some ministerial statement or yes. statement by the government say that said she yes. said knowingly and deliberately. Is that, did you say knowingly there, and deliberately? There are a number of reasons yes. that the government I, would have possibly failed to, sorry, to comply. Sorry. However, knowingly and deliberately is a state of mind, as the lawyer would know. Yes. Is, uh, let, 
please. Senator Barnett Ellis, did you use the words knowingly and deliberately? I did use the words knowingly okay. and deliberately, and I used yeah, the words. Yeah, that, I, I that used that the words knowingly and deliberately because they did not accidentally. No, no, no fail no, to comply no, with the law and it is not as if the government I, I was think not I have one request that you would withdraw context. those words because you were not there to purposely that's that's um improper imputations improper imputations Madam uh, an offense that rules I suggest that you withdraw those words if not I'll have them struck from the record what is your option at this point in time I'm not withdrawing those words. okay I'll have them struck from the record off. please proceed with your presentation thank, thank you. you so we're going to strike from the record the words knowingly and deliberately thank you Please proceed. The Prime Minister in that other place has said that they are not breaking the law and that they are finalizing a report on contracts awarded by his administration since coming into office in September 2021. But Madam President, as I said just now, they were supposed to be providing us with this information within 60 days of granting those, comments, those contracts. It is now 18 months later and they are finalizing a report to give us information that they ought to have been giving us all along. Section 61 of the Public Procurement Act, an act that was duly enacted and valid and in operation, contains the requirement to publish notice of the award of procurement contracts within 60 days of the award of the contract. This provision is repeated in Section 57 of the present bill. In fact, Section 57 of the present bill requires additional information to be published along with that notice. It begs the question, Madam President, if the government did not comply with Section 61 of the existing Act, why are they now going to comply with Section 57 in this new bill, which requires them to do the exact same thing. If this was a courtroom, the judge would ask, what has been the change in circumstances that would warrant this behavior? This bill has been marketed as having sweeping changes to the, procure, to the public procurement procedures in the Bahamas. But many of the terms of the existing procurement act, which has been described as unworkable, have been repeated almost identically in the present bill. Madam President, why should we trust them now to comply with the provisions that they have not complied with for the last 18 months? Do they expect the public to believe that with the stroke of the Governor General's pen on this new procurement legislation, that they will suddenly feel compelled to comply? In fact, it was the same Governor General that signed the present legislation with the same provisions that they ignored for 18 months. Was the obligation to publish notice of the awards of contracts so troublesome that they could not comply, but not so troublesome that they wanted to change it? was one of the challenges that the Prime Minister said was not workable and w warranted a repeal of, was this, sorry, was this one of the challenges that the Prime Minister said was unworkable and warranted an appeal of the existing legislation? They did not comply before. They cannot be trusted to comply with this new legislation. This this bill is evidence of this administration's steady moonwalk away from being trustworthy and exercising good governance, accountability, and transparency. Madam President, this draft legislation increases the list of contracts that are kept secret, more secret deals with our public resources. The Organization for Responsible Governance also known as ORG Bahamas, is a nonprofit civic organization which focuses on permit promoting the concepts of good governance. A part of their website is the Policy Center, in which they analyze upcoming legislation 
with relation to accountability and transparency. The analysis of this public procurement bill outlines areas in this bill where the government missed opportunities to strengthen the legislation. In fact, there were 15 missed opportunities to bring this legislation in line with best practices when it comes to transparency and accountability. In fact, 11 of those missed opportunities are as a result of the government removing obligations and terms from the existing Procurement Act. This moonwalk away from transparency and accountability is ever present in the Public Finance Management Bill. Fiscal transparency ensures that all decision makers have the information that they need to make efficient financial decisions. It forces a government to be accountable for its use of public resources. The public treasury is not a slush fund. It represents hard-earned assets, hard-earned resources of the Bahamian people, those resident here, and those doing business in the Bahamas. Madam President, here are some examples of how this bill departs from best practices regarding fiscal responsibility, accountability, and transparency. There are three areas in this bill which I will discuss and demonstrate that this draft legislation is another example for the, of the departure from transparency and accountability. The Fiscal Strategy Report was created by the Fiscal Responsibility Act. It was meant to compel cabinet, which is one branch of government, the executive, to set out its proposed fiscal strategy to be debated by the legislature, a second branch of government. The benefits of debating fiscal, the fiscal strategy report in both parliamentary chambers meant that the cabinet received the benefit of comments and recommendations from backbenchers and members of the opposition. Ideally, the fiscal strategy report was meant to guide and influence the creation of the budget. The fiscal strategy report was meant to be tabled on the third Wednesday in December, and by the 31st of January, after that report is debated in Parliament, the, minister, the Parliament shall inform the Minister of Finance of its recommendations it had any, therefore giving the executive and public bodies several months after the acceptance of the fiscal strategy report to plan their budget for the upcoming financial year. By combining the fiscal strategy report with the budget debate, we lose the opportunity for consultation on the fiscal strategy of the country, but maybe that was the point. If we can't participate in the process the cabinet has free reign to do as they please without having to hear or consider what matters to many of the Bahamians not at the cabinet table. This draft legislation, if passed, would mean that backbenchers, senators, or members of the opposition could not participate in the fiscal policy of our great nation in a meaningful way. Governments are continuous. The fiscal strategy of the Bahamas is not simply a five-year plan or a Davis Cooper plan. It impacts all of us, all of the members of parliament, which are representatives of the citizens and residents of the Bahamas, ought to be given an opportunity to have input in the fiscal strategy of the Bahamas. This administration cannot be so politically immature that they have no desire to even consider the recommendations from backbenchers or members of the opposition, or that they only want to hear recommendations when it is too late to implement them. This principle also applies in employment law. If an employer has made a decision to terminate an employee without a proper investigation, which includes receiving information from others, the termination is unfair. Consultation and debate are critical to the decision-making process. The second 
and I submit the most egregious departure from transparency and accountability is found in Section 10 of the Public Finance Management Act. This draft legislation, contrary to the Constitution of the Bahamas, intends to restrict the powers of the Auditor General. Madam President, Article 136, Subsection 3 of the Constitution provides that all departments and offices of the government shall at least once a year be audited and reported on by the Auditor General who, with his support staff, shall at all times be entitled to have access to all books, records, returns, and reports relating to such accounts. And subsection 5 of that article says that in the exercise of his functions under that previous paragraph, paragraph subsection 3, the Auditor General shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. But this draft legislation restricts the Auditor General for questioning the merits of a policy of policy objectives of any government department. It restricts the Auditor General from examining the policies of government business enterprises. In other words, government enterprises like Bahamas Air can run as e inefficiently and as recklessly as they want without any investigation by the Auditor General. Madam President, I hope that this draft legislation is withdrawn to address this most grievous position. If we cannot trust this cabinet to draft legislation which is consistent with the Constitution, and they want us to believe that they are going to follow the provisions of their new procurement act after they have been ignoring the old one for 18 months, Madam President, when we look at the move to change the timing of the fiscal strategy report and the proposed restrictions on the Auditor General's powers, it is apparent that there is a departure from consultation and accountability, two fundamental components of good government. The third area of concern that I will deal with, as time does not give me the luxury of publicly dissecting these bills to point out all of the departures from good governance, is the interference with the independence of the Fiscal Responsibility Council. Under the current legislation, the fiscal... No problem. Under the current legislation, the Fiscal Responsibility Council is an independent body. Its members are appointed by the Governor General on advice of the Speaker of the House of Assembly, the head of the legislative branch of government. And remember what I said earlier, fiscal responsibility rests with the executive. And by having the Fiscal Responsibility Council come under a separate branch of government, that provides accountability. It acts as a check and balance, a crucial element to ensure good governance. They have the independent ability to hire their own experts and give advice. This bill makes several destructive changes to the operation and composition of the Fiscal Responsibility Council, which impacts the independence of that body. First, under this bill, Members of the Fiscal Responsibility Council will now be appointed by the Minister of Finance. This stinks of political influence and runs... Thank you, Senator. I thank Senator Ellis for yielding, Madam President. Madam President, I move that the Senate do sit beyond 1 o'clock. Is there a Second. seconder? It has been moved and seconded that the Senate do sit beyond 1 o'clock. <laughs> As many ayes in favor say aye. <laughs> Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The Senate will sit beyond the 1 p.m. hour. Please proceed, Senator Michael Abonadellis. I'm obliged. <laughs> no, no, no. This stinks of political influence and runs the real risk that the Council we become, will become another opportunity for granting political favors 
rather than being comprised of independent fiscal experts. When this is coupled with the fact that the legislation adds a new ground for the removal of a council member, and that is that the member's presence is inconvenient. The words say the removal of the member of the member appears to be necessary for the effective performance of the fiscal council. But let's be real. This means that if a member disagrees with cabinet's fiscal strategy and the objectives of the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance can have that member removed. And when we marry that with the fact that this new, this new legislation would make it an offense for a council member to disclose confidential information without consent. Under this new bill, it is not an offense if a public officer unlawfully takes possession of public resources. It's not an offense if a public officer dishonestly appropriates public resources, in other words, steals. It is not an offense if a public officer provides inaccurate information or conceals information on public resources. It Madam is President. not an offense if a public officer engages in corrupt acts, including soliciting bribes, but it is an offense if a council member is a whistleblower and brings matters of concern to the public. She's an attorney. Madam President, the present Public Finance Management Act was hailed as modern legislation, codifying the management of our public finances, bringing with it transparency and accountability. But this New Day government wants to repeal and replace this transformative legislation with watered-down legislation that allows for greater political influence and an increased risk of mismanagement and corruption. How are we, su to su how are we supposed to trust an administration that has demonstrated a pattern inconsistent with principles of good governance? The blueprint said that they were committed to good governance and accountability. So why would they remove the power of the Public Accounts Committee to review financial statements of the government and annual reports for public entities and government business enterprises? How can the electorate and residents of the Bahamas have confidence in the fiscal management of the Bahamas if this New Day administration seeks to pass pieces of legislation that strips away the checks and balances necessary for accountability and transparency. To paraphrase Senator the Honorable Darren Pickstock, this is bad law and we are afraid. It is in the interest of our people to continuously raise the levels of accountability, consultation, and transparency, especially when it comes to the management of public resources. Madam President, I will end this contribution by quoting another article from the Constitution. Article 72.1 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas says, There shall be a cabinet for the Bahamas which shall have the general direction and control of the government of the Bahamas and shall be collectively responsible, therefore, to Parliament. The Manual of Cabinet Procedures of the Bahamas states, at Rule 3, a fundamental principle of cabinet government is unity. It is important to present a unified front to the public. If any minister feels conscientiously unable to support a decision taken by cabinet, he has one course of action open to him, and that is to resign his office. Rule 6 says, so long as a minister remains a minister, he may not speak in public or in private against a decision of cabinet or against an individual decision of another minister. As, a member, as he is a member of the government bench in the House of Assembly or in the Senate, he must not speak or vote on any measure debated in the House otherwise than on lines of greed by cabinet. 
I have spoken in this place on more than one occasion on the need for certainty and how it is important to government. The requirement of collective responsibility is not simply an archaic concept that we have adopted from across the Atlantic. It is imperative that the public has confidence in the decisions made by cabinet. The recent departure from collective responsibility undermines the efficacy of cabinet and erodes the public trust in that institution. Madam President, it continues to be a new day, but not a better day. The Bahamas deserves an administration that we can trust to function in accordance with the principles of good government and to comply with the laws and the constitution of this land of perpetual sunshine. It is good to have you back in the chair, Madam President. May God bless you and may God bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and may our banners always wave high. Thank you, Senator the Honorable Michael Bonnet Ellis, for your contribution, as many. The Chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Barry Griffin. Madam President, um, this is a convenient time to move for the luncheon suspension, so I move that the Senate do suspend until 3 p.m. this afternoon, at which time Senator Barry Griffin will have the floor. Is there a second there? Second. Yeah. It has been moved and second that the Senate suspends until 3 p.m. As many are as in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. The Senate stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. Hey. Huh? <laughs> 